We're going to do a fireside chat now, and I'm delighted to welcome New York Department of Financial Services Superintendent Adrian Harris to our conference for a keynote fireside chat. Superintendent Harris was confirmed by the New York State Senate on January 25th, 2022. She received her MBA here at Stern and her JD from Columbia Law. Her career in public service includes service as a senior advisor to the Treasury Department, where I was her colleague, uh, and as special assistant to the president for economic policy in the White House. She's also served as a professor and faculty co-director at the Ford School of Public Policy Center on Finance, Law, and Policy at the University of Michigan. She brings enormous energy, experience, and wisdom to this job. Welcome, Superintendent Harris. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Let's start with your overall responsibilities. You've said, in effect, if you, you provide financial services in New York, we regulate. <laughs> yeah. uh, so your role has implications across America and the world. Could you flesh out the scope of your responsibilities just a little bit for us? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. It's so good to be here with you all this morning and come back to my alma mater and come back into some of the classrooms uh, that I spent so much time in many years ago. Uh, so at DFS, we uh, we are the combination of what used to be the state banking department and insurance departments. And since then, our responsibilities have grown tremendously. So we regulate uh, several hundred banks and credit unions, including 15 GSIBs and about 120 foreign uh, banking institutions. We regulate all the insurance in the state, so health, property, and casualty, and life insurance. We are the only prudential regulator with crypto specific authority in the country, state or, or federal, and really have become the, the leading crypto regulator uh, in the world, having built the largest crypto regulatory unit anywhere. Uh, we regulate pharmacy benefit managers, we regulate mortgage lending and servicing, we regulate student loan servicing. Um, so that is why I often say, if you are providing a financial service in New York, you are more than likely regulated uh, by DFS. Great. Well, on climate, you hit the ground running at DFS, uh, establishing the first in the nation standalone climate division and guidance for New York domestic insurers on managing the financial risks from climate change, even before you were confirmed. Can you tell us about the responsibilities of that division? and some of the guidance and what's been happening since 2022. Yeah, absolutely. So when I came in, it was, there was, there were people in the department working on climate, but for me, because of the implications for insurance and for banks, I thought it was really important to elevate the climate office and then the few people who were doing climate work to an executive level uh, position and create the division so that we would have the, the resources, the data, the information, to think about the ramifications of climate across all of the institutions we regulate. And some of that is about the safety and soundness of the institutions we, we oversee, making sure they're thinking about the risks of climate and the implications for their, their balance sheet. But it also has to do with their operations. Um, things that are very simple for those of you who are in the city for, for Sandy, and there's the iconic picture of Manhattan where it's completely dark below the park, except for Goldman Sachs at 200 West Street, right? Because they put the generator on the roof instead of having it in the basement. Um, and so a lot of our, our um, guidance is not just about safety and soundness and transition risk and physical risk, but also about operational resilience for, for financial institutions, especially as we think about where you house your data centers and, and other things. So the insurance guidance was some of the first work um, that we did just telling insurers, and of course we think about it mostly with property and casualty insurance, but it's also important for life insurers and health insurers to be thinking about the risks um, that, they're, that they're underwriting and how the world is gonna change with respect to climate. Um, so we require that our insurers participate in the National Association of Insurance Commissioner Climate Risk Disclosure Survey, that's a mouthful, um, and then we analyze that data. Um, we also have incorporated climate risk into our examination processes. So the main function, of course, of our regulators is to go and examine our regulated entities, sort of audit them and make sure they're complying with all the regulations for the state. And so we've incorporated climate into our examination processes. And then at the end of last year, we complemented our insurance guidance with uh, guidance for our banking and mortgage institutions as well 
so that they could start to think about uh, climate risk for their safety and soundness and their operational resilience. So we continue to grow our climate division. We're now, we just added staff to start thinking about physical resiliency and how the regulated financial sector can, can assist the state and municipalities around the state with physical resiliency as well. Well, from that description, it's pretty clear that your goals and ours align at the Volatility and Risk Institute. And I teach risk management, so I was very pleased to see that risk culture and governance feature prominently uh, in that guidance. And at the Volatility and Risk Institute, we've done work on climate scenarios uh, and stress testing, so I was happy to see your guidance on scenario analysis. Yeah. Your guidance discusses the need for better public dis disclosure. So how do we navigate uh, the need for better data, which we just heard about over yeah, the, you know, the, the data piece, as you know, is so challenging because thinking about climate in this way is sort of relatively new, certainly in the context of, of governance and, and oversight. And we regulate so many institutions and diversity of institutions. As I said, we have 15 GSIBs, for example, that we regulate. We're the group-wide supervisor for MetLife and AIG, right? These are huge institutions. But we also regulate banks with, you know, $13 million in, in deposits or insurance brokers that are one or two people. And so how do you think about governance? How do you think about data? How do you think about disclosures with that type of diversity under your, your regulatory purview? And it's really a challenge. And I think for us, one of the things we think a lot about, in addition to making our insurers, for instance, participate in the NAIC uh, survey, is how can we aggregate data? How do we take information from the larger, more well-resourced, maybe more sophisticated institutions that we regulate and make it usable uh, for the smaller institutions who are not going to have climate expertise on staff, who are not going to have data analytics capabilities, who may not even be able to collect this data in a robust way. And so part of our job, in addition to having some requirements on the books and examining for the requirements that we put into law, is to try and help provide resources. Um, and so we do a lot of partnering with different institutions, both in the state, nationally, and, and internationally. And we spend a lot of time engaging with all of our stakeholders to make sure that we're also providing information. And then, of course, disclosures have become such a big part of the public policy conversation, whether you're talking about the Fed or, or the SEC. For us, we want to make sure we're not uh, putting in place requirements that conflict with other regulatory agencies. Um, we want to be careful as we think about regulatory burden and again, how we service the diversity of, of institutions that we regulate. Uh, and that's always a challenge to make sure we're, we're harmonizing where we can, uh, but doing the things that we know we need to do for New York and New Yorkers that may be different from some other regulators. Great, so your work will help improve the safety and soundness of insurers and resilience uh, of the industry, but we see as the premise of this conference uh, indicates, that the gaps are growing between the risks of climate change and the capacity of insurance and new insurance to price and management. So what should and can you do uh, at DFS to narrow those gaps? And are there policy options that can reduce uh, the exposures to physical risks like sea level rise that yeah. we face here in New York uh, and wildfires elsewhere in the country? Yeah, the property and casualty space um, is so challenging right now. I mean, one of the things we do with DFS is we have to approve rate increases um, for health insurance, for property and casualty insurance, for life insurance. It's, there, there are many unpleasant aspects to my job, but that may uh, rank near the top when insurance companies come to us and say, we need a 10%, 20%, 30% rate increase. And then we have a wonderful team of actuaries that check the assumptions from the insurance companies that are really scrubbing the data. We wanna make sure we have safe and sound institutions. We want institutions to be profitable because that means they'll stay here in New York and increase competition. Um, and of course you have to be a profitable insurance company if you're gonna be able to pay claims when they are due. So that profitability is important, but we also have to be mindful of all the increased costs that consumers are facing. It's a very tough balance to strike. Nobody's ever really happy with the balance that we strike. Everybody's always a little upset with us as we think about uh, insurance rates. Um, but it, I think in the last couple of years, it's become particularly challenging because of climate risk, because of inflation and replacement costs. The reinsurance market has gotten much, much 
tighter and the capacity there is is shrinking and they're willing less willing to take risks from direct insurers and so you have this confluence of, of circumstances that has really led to rate increases of you know 20 30 40 percent um, and if you're in a coastal area um, it's just it's almost untenable um, so for us, one of the things we did, I've been really big on engagement uh, with all of our stakeholders. We convened a, a group of industry participants, reinsurers, mortgage lenders, uh, direct insurers, and said, all right, let's 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 look at the categories or the buckets of possible solutions. State insurers of, of last resort, which haven't been shown to work super well, but let's explore it. Maybe there's something different we can do um, in New York or catastrophic reinsurance by the state, or how do we think about anti-rebating laws and other resiliency things that we can do for homeowners um, that maybe now are prohibited by anti-rebating laws, but if we change that, we'll help mitigate risk for, for homeowners and therefore for insurance companies. So uh, we, we made assignments to the industry uh, to help us research and, and think through some of these policy options, and they've been very responsive. It's, it's a great example, I think, of where market and industry interests are well aligned with, with consumer interests to make sure that we are creating a more resilient infrastructure and, and keeping costs as low as we can for, for New Yorkers. Yeah. But I remind people all the time when, when people call DFS and complain about rate increases, which we understand and say, you know, everybody at DFS, myself included, is also a, a consumer. And so I approve rate increases. And I remember one day my insurance broker um, called me when my policies were getting ready to renew. And she's like, you know, I really have this bad news. Like your auto insurance and your homeowner's insurance are going to increase by X. And I was like, I know. Cause I, <laughs> <laughs> I approved that rate filing. I know exactly what was, what was going to happen, but it is good because we are all consumers ourselves. Right. And so we really have skin in the game when we're thinking about these policy decisions. Yeah, and that's really important. That engagement is really a hallmark of your uh, the things you do to inform your decision making. Um, having worked in Washington, what help do you need in that regard? <laughs> yeah, I think it, you know it's been for me as I think about my career, having spent time in the private sector um, as a lawyer here in New York and um, as a tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and then having the experience at Treasury in the White House before before coming here, I really try to draw on all of those experiences in, in policymaking. And I think the relationships um, from Washington have really proven to be a benefit to the department and, and hopefully to New Yorkers. I think that was certainly true during the banking crisis of, of last year, um, <laughs> having longstanding relationships with the, the federal regulators when we were experiencing that, that turmoil. Um, but I think it, it helps us, you know, in, in climate where we can really have robust discussions with the Fed, with Treasury, with the White House, because I, I know as you, as you do, right, how those, those systems work there. Uh, I think we're very fortunate now as New Yorkers to have the Senate Majority Leader and the House Minority Leader both be New Yorkers. Not a bad thing at all when it comes to thinking about resiliency and, and the things we need um, from Washington. But I think, as you said, you know, I have been very focused on engagement. Historically, DFS had a reputation for being a bit of a lone wolf. Uh, but for me, it's been very important in every policy decision that we make, big or small, to engage academia and industry and advocates and state legislators and federal legislators. Um, and we, I think we've done so with a lot of success. Um, and not just our New York delegation, but delegations from across the country um, and on both sides of the aisle. Um, and it really helps, I think, New York be a leader as the financial capital of the world, but not be out on a limb so far by ourselves that, that people can't follow. And one of the examples that I use, when we did the banking climate guidance, um, the original drafts that the team provided to me in, in all candor were, were very aggressive. And they were like, we're in New York, we're going to be a leader. Like we have to, you know, go as far as we can and do all these things. And my counsel to the team was, you can't be a leader if nobody follows. Mm -hmm. So we need to put climate guidance in place that pushes the boundaries, right? And, and moves the dialogue and moves the, the compliance framework and governance framework along in a way um, that we're progressing but in a way that 
that others might take something from it and, and follow suit. And so one of the first people I shared the climate guidance with, which at the time I didn't share publicly, and then I, I said it in a public context. And so now it's out there. But one of the, the first people I shared it with was the banking commissioner from Texas. And not because I thought, you know, Texas or Florida or, you know, any of these states would say, we're going to do exactly what New York does. But I thought if there is something in here that, you know, one of those states says, okay, like we could do something similar as well. That's when we will know we are really leading um, in this space, right? And it doesn't mean that we took all the feedback we got from diverse stakeholders, but that sort of socialization and engagement I thought was was really important to make sure that yes, we were moving things forward and progressing when it comes to climate risk. But again, we were doing so in a way that that others would also find things that, that they could mimic um, and imitate. And that's how we're gonna make real progress here. Yeah. So we've been alluding to the fundamental tension yes. between affordability for insurance products yeah. and the ability of the, ins the providers of insurance and the incentives that might be involved in order to make uh, a profit on their business. Yeah. And how do we dig a little deeper into yeah. that? How do we navigate that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think people think about insurance companies um, and usually people don't have fond associations of their insurance companies. Um, you know, and that's why regulators exist, right? So we can examine them and make sure they're behaving the way they are supposed to behave. I've been very focused on kitchen table issues since since coming in um, to the role to the tune of uh, last year, we were able to get $182 million back to New Yorkers in the form of restitution through complaints and enforcement actions. But we also want profitable, safe and sound going concerns uh, here in New York, and I'm sure folks here have followed some of the news out of California and Florida, where because they were holding insurance rates artificially low, insurers just left those markets. And so then you're left with a more limited competitive base. And what is that going to do to, to prices? And what does that do for consumers if they can't find somebody to insure their risk? So again, we're always trying to strike this balance between affordability and accessibility. I want companies to be profitable. Doesn't mean I want them, you know, gouging and, and running away with the store, but I want them to be profitable because A, that's how they're going to be able to pay claims. And that's what's going to attract them to the market, create competition here in New York, create choice for consumers, will also help keep prices low. Um, but it has to be reasonable. And so we look at profitability um, as part of our analysis to make sure that we feel like it's it's reasonable to attract business to the state, but that it's being fair um, to consumers. And as I said, uh, it's a very challenging balance, but I feel very uh, grateful that we have such a wonderful team of, of actuaries and, and data scientists um, at the department who really spend a lot of time uh, with the companies, pushing back on their assumptions, checking the data to make sure that we're striking that balance um, as best as we can. In my class, I explained to students why climate-related risks affect minorities, lower-income populations more acutely than the average, and I think everybody's uh, aware of that. So as the first woman of color to supervise NYDFS, you know the reasons better than I do. Why should, uh, what should, and what can you do as a financial regulator to reduce the incidence of climate risk on those groups? Yeah. It was, it's a really important question, right? There's so many of these uh, broader societal dynamics that disproportionately affect low and moderate income communities, communities of color. Um, when it comes to climate risk, I mean, when I came into the seat, it was right after Hurricane Ida. And one of the first things I did is I went out to Queens to look at some of the basement apartments uh, where people you know, had, had lost not only their homes, but in some of the most tragic ways that people had lost their lives. Um, and so as we think about climate guidance and our regulatory responsibility, we don't want to create um, additional disincentive to service these populations that already have problems in mortgage underwriting, who already face discrimination and disparate impact when it comes to you know mortgage insurance, all of these things. And so we have to strike this balance with, to say, you have to manage your climate risk but you can't do it at the expense of your anti-discrimination mandates. Um, 
for us, that meant, especially in the mortgage and banking context, calling out this tension explicitly. And I was really proud of the team because I had not seen another regulator explicitly say climate goals and uh, anti-discrimination goals will conflict. And so for us as a regulator, I thought it was our responsibility to, to de-conflict them and to say, you cannot meet your climate goals at the expense of your fair lending goals and your anti-discrimination goals. It cannot be the right answer to say, well, I know how to take climate risk off my balance sheet. I won't lend in far Rockaway, right? Or I won't lend in, in the Bronx where there are real drainage issues that cause a lot of flooding. That cannot be the way. It cannot be black and brown people in immigrant communities and LMI communities that that suffer disproportionately because we're all trying to meet these climate goals. You know, you, you go to your, these big companies, and like you're all smart people, and they trust that we can figure this out together. Um, but the, the ask that industry had of us is, okay, well, help us manage this tension. And so we had to make a decision to say that the fair lending objectives had to take priority over climate objectives. So where there is that direct tension and trade-off, we said fair lending prevails. And then you have to find other ways to think about your climate risk and, and safety and soundness so that we didn't have an, an instance where people stopped lending in the far walk away in the Bronx and said, well, you told me to because of climate. That was not going to be a good a good outcome. But like all the other things I've described, it is a tough balance um, to strike, but it's something that we're incredibly mindful of. Well, our work at the Volatility and Risk Institute is aimed at informing public policy decisions, including yours. Yeah. How can we help? <laughs> I love this question. Because um, we, we need... Um, we need help, we need folks like you in the, the center and, and folks here in the audience who are thinking about these things, right, in, in all kinds of different ways. So we are always, uh, we have formal and informal programs at DFS so that we can engage with entrepreneurs, academics. We try to be just very open, you know, to, to people coming in and saying, hey, I've done some, some research. Hey, we're having a conference. Hey, we, I was meeting with a company yesterday, an insurance company that's doing a lot of greening resilience work and they said we started to measure and we're researching let us come in and show you what's worked and, and what hasn't worked so the more engagement we have um with all of our stakeholders the more we learn and can work together uh, to make sure that the policy we're advancing is is equitable and innovative and effective um so that's always uh important the other thing i would say um i know you have a, a mix of people here in the audience we're always looking for good talent uh, <laughs> at the regulator whenever I speak to private sector audience, I'm like, you take the pay cut uh, and come and work for the government. But we really have been hiring um, quite a lot. In my two and a half years, we've now hired over 400 people. We've promoted about 350 of our existing team members. Um, we've brought in people from academia, from other regulators, from the private sector, uh, so that we have that diversity of viewpoints and experiences in. So, Anybody's thinking about a change in your professional life, you should come and find me after. <laughs> We'd be glad to talk to you. And you come to the right place because our product is talented, passionate exactly. students who are interested in the things that you do. Well, I'll tell you, the thing that brought me to Stern uh, when I was here uh, as a student was uh, the, the dean at the time said to me, you know, business school produces lots of management consultants and investment <laughs> bankers, and that's great. Um, but business students should also be interested in, in public policy and in, in government. And I was practicing law in the city at the time. And I was like, I'm not really going to go back to school. It seems like a terrible idea. Um, but I'm so glad that I, you know, that I came to CERN and, and got my MBA here and it really informed, helps inform a lot of my thinking. And I do think it's important, um, for people with different educational backgrounds and, and to come and be engaged in the public policy process, because that's how we're going to make the most effective, equitable, and innovative policy.